Thank you for viewing this educational video. My name is Dr. Linda Trailer, and I'm Head of Clinical Development and Medical Affairs at Biodesics. The title of my presentation today is The Value of Proteomic Testing in the Management of Lung Cancer Patients. The agenda for my presentation is listed in this slide. I'm going to start with a very brief overview of Biodesics Clinical Laboratory. I'm going to touch on the need for biomarkers in lung cancer treatment, especially the challenges associated with clinically validating these tests. Then I'm going to, the remainder of the presentation will be an overview of the Barristrat test, which is the first machine learning mass spec based proteomic test clinically validated for clinical use. We're going to review peer reviewed data to support the clinical validation of this test, as well as end the presentation with real-world case studies demonstrating its utility. Biodesics Clinical Laboratory is based in Boulder, Colorado. We are CAP accredited and CLIA certified. We manufacture genomic and proteomic tests from discovery to commercialization. We're also accredited by the New York State CLEF and ISO organizations. The technology we use for our genetic platform is Droplet Digital PCR. However, the presentation today is going to focus on our proteomic test, which is Molotov mass spec based, as well as machine learning based. There is an overall clinical need for biomarkers in lung cancer, and really all cancers, throughout the continuum of care from prevention and screening all the way to end of life management. Once a patient is diagnosed with cancer, the clinical utility of a biomarker is more around prognostic utility or predictive utility. Meaning, is it treatment dependent, predictive, or is it treatment independent, prognostic? Identifying the biomarker is the easy part of the process. Taking the bi that biomarker through analytical and clinical validation, as well as demonstrating its clinical utility are where most biomarkers fail. And this was demonstrated in a publication in 2011, where they reported that there were over 150,000 publications identifying a clinical biomarker. Yet there are only about 100 clinical biomarkers in clinical practice. Fast forward six years or so, that number is more than 500,000 in terms of publications identifying biomarkers, yet the number of clinically validated tests has changed very little. Validation is, the challenges associated with validation are fairly straightforward. However, the challenges associated with demonstrating clinical utility is a little bit more complex. And that's why we believe that you need a complex biomarker to really capture the complex disease state. This includes molecular data acquisition from the patient and then converting that information into a clinically informed label. This table sum compares the univariate and multivariate test approach. There are some success stories with the univariate biomarker. Typically, it's very specific and is focused on mutation testing and targeted therapy is a good example of how or, or when univariate tests are successful. However, they rarely capture the complexity of the disease state. Multivariate tests, on the other hand, use many features to try and capture the complexity of the disease state. In particular, mass spec provides a unique capability of detecting an unbiased array of proteins in their relative concentrations simultaneously. And that's what the Verstrat test is. Verastrat test is a clinically validated multivariate protein label. It is, was developed on mass spectra from patient sera, meaning it is a blood-based test, and it reports out as a binary result, Verastrat good or Verastrat poor. The Verastrat poor is highly correlated, the signature is highly correlated with an increase in acute phase reactants and acute phase uh, response pathway. This is what we know, what we now know, is a host response to tumor activity. And it's highly correlated with an aggressive disease state. The Verstrap poor signature is overall poor prognosis for patients 
and it is independent of other known prognostic or predictive markers. How is this used in clinical practice? When a patient is diagnosed, they undergo mutational testing to identify the presence of a driver mutation. Despite the advance, advances we have made in lung cancer treatment options for patients, if they have a driver mutation, this trumps other treatment decisions. However, prognostic information is available uh, at frontline and all lines of therapy and is independent of mutation testing. The Verastrat test has been demonstrated to be prognostic at frontline and subsequent lines of therapy, and it represents about, at advanced stage disease, Verastrat represents about 30% poor patients and 70% Verastrat good patients. As expected, this number, in the, Verastrat, the percentage of Verastrat poor patients increases as the disease gets more advanced. So who's ordering genetic and proteomic testing? Surprisingly, it, less than 35% of the time, the medical oncologists are ordering this test. There's been a shift to the physicians and the specialties that actually diagnose lung cancer. And that is typically the thoracic surgeons or the pul pulmonologists or interventional pulmonologists. The benefit of this shift in ordering patterns is that when they, the patient is ultimately referred to the medical oncologist for treatment, they, they go to the, the physician with the necessary prognostic and predictive test information to define treatment strategies. So let's take a look at the clinical evidence used to validate the Verstrat test. It is noteworthy that we are a sole source manufacturer of the Verstrat test, and it is the um, so there is a, um, as a result of that, there is no comparator associated with, uh, uh, in this setting rather. So the, we're going to be focusing on the Verastrat test uh, and, and evaluating the clinical evidence. Typically, biomarkers are developed and validated in a stepwise fashion, as demonstrated in this graphic. Retrospective validation and discovery occur first. Then you test prospectively the clinical utility of the biomarker. And then you evaluate the impact it has on treatment decisions, as well as on net health outcomes. We're going to review data from each of these steps in the presentation today. Retrospective validation of the Verastrat test was accomplished on many sample sets. We tested over 5,000 patient samples using the Verastrat test, including multiple types of therapy and multiple lines of therapy, as well as more aggressive combination therapies, and including early stage surgical intervention. The study average of the hazard ratio for all of these sample sets combined is only about 0.45 in favor of Verastrat good. However, there are a handful of sample sets that are closer to the 1.0 hazard ratio, meaning the Verastrat good and the Verastrat poor patients perform equally as well. And typically, those are the more aggressive combination therapies or disease state changing intervention such as surgery. This means that Verastrat poor patients have options if they want to try and treat their high-risk disease state more aggressively. Let's take a look at this, the, the clinical utility of Verastrat in a prospectively designed study. This study is referred to as the PRO study, and it was published in 2014. The study was conducted in advanced lung cancer patients, second line, who had advanced who, who had progressed on um, the standard of care platinum develop regimen. There are a couple of highlights I'm going to walk through for this uh, overall survival curve from the study. First, let me point out the blue lines represent the Verastrat good patients. The orange lines represent the Verastrat poor patients. The dotted lines represent the patients who are treated with chemotherapy. And the solid lines represent the patients who are treated with erlotinib. One of the interesting points here is that if you're a Verastrat good, you perform equally well on 
chemotherapy as you do on targeted erlotinib therapy, independent of mutation status because this was an unselected patient population. Another interesting point is that if you are a very strep poor patient, you do not perform well at all on the targeted, chemo, uh, the targeted therapy. You perform a little bit better on the chemotherapy. Um, however, the test overall is powerfully prognostic independent of treatment regimen. The bare strep, good overall survival, median overall survival was around 11 months compared to the bare strep poor overall survival of four to six months depending on the treatment. So this study demonstrated that bare strep is not only predictive in certain uh, scenarios, but it's highly prognostic, which is consistent with what we saw in the retrospective sample sets. So how does a prognostic test impact treatment decisions in clinical practice? This is a study published in 2017 by Akerley et al. Prospective data collection taking place in normal, by normal ordering physicians was evaluated, and these physicians volunteered to do a pre-test treatment plan form as well as a post-test treatment decision form over the course of about four years from 2012 to 2016. And this resulted in about 2,500 tests evaluated. And the conclusions from this study is 82% of physicians actually changed their treatment decision based on the, Ver the Veristrat result. This is really pronounced in the Veristrat poor patient population, where 25% of the patients elected to have best supportive care therapy compared to 1% before the Veristrat test results were known. In addition, physicians made treatment, de treatment decision changes based on these results from one active therapy to another. So the Veristrat facilitates conversations between physicians and patients about prognosis and best supportive care or hospice care, a common yet difficult discussion occurs more frequently. And this is independent of age. If you look at, if you divide this patient set into two patient cohorts, those who are over 65 and those who are under 65, and look at the data uh, from that in a multivariate analysis, you can see that there is a similar overall percentage of Veristrat pores in both populations. And after a multivariate uh, analysis correcting for age and gender and other uh, typical um, uh, variables, the percent of Veristrat poor patients who actually chose uh, best supportive care as a treatment option was the same in both patient populations. So this is not a discussion for the elderly. Finally, we're going to review data on how the, a prognostic test impacts net health outcomes. There are two data sets I'm going to review for this evaluation. The first is a data set that was presented in March of 2017 at the American College of Medical, Medical Quality Conference. This, the objective of this study is to evaluate cost effectiveness of using a prognostic test and uh, when having shared treatment discussions with the patients. The endpoints were treatment utilization without and with Veristrat results, but it also include outcomes, other quality measures, and then costs. And the results from this study demonstrated an overall improvement of outcomes by nearly a month, as well as a cost savings of over $1,000 per patient. This was even more pronounced in the Veristrat poor population, where the outcomes were improved as, uh, in a similar, at a similar rate as to the entire patient population. However, the net cost savings per patient was over $10,000 in the Veristrat poor, uh, Veristrat poor population. So Veristrat enables physicians to avoid ineffective, costly treatments. This next and separate publication is, was published in September of 2017 in Managed Care, and this was a comprehensive and targeted literature review of real-world case studies. The results demonstrated, not surprisingly, that candid discussion around prognosis is critical to the overall quality of, uh, uh, of patient care. 
However, diagnostic tools to support these conversations are limited. It was also demonstrated in this evaluation that Veristrat helps physicians not only have this conversation, but meet their oncology care model metrics for those who are practicing under this model. If you take a look at the key metrics and regulations for oncology care model and MACRA, you can see highlighted in red key metrics that are enhanced by having an objective prognostic tool. Obviously prognosis, treatment goals, expected response to treatment, as well as defining advanced care plans. So we're going to end the presentation with three case studies that demonstrate the use of a prognostic tool in managing lung cancer patients. Case study one is a 61-year-old female diagnosed with advanced stage disease, metastatic disease, and is chemo ineligible. Proteomic and genomic testing up front revealed that the patient was KRAS positive, as well as Veristrat 4, and negative for pd one expression. Given that you have two prognostic factors that are um, positive in this patient, this is a high-risk aggressive disease, which is meaningful information to have when planning your treatment strategy. Based on these results, they shortened and, and had a more aggressive follow-up schedule from six months to three months. But in addition, um, the, the patient chose to enroll in a clinical study to, uh, with um, a focus on a more aggressive treatment regimen. Nevertheless, the, the patient quickly progressed, not surprisingly. Case study two, this is a 71-year-old male, again with diagnosed with advanced stage metastatic disease. There, were, there was no genomic or proteomic test available up front, so the patient began standard of care platinum doublet regimen, which is, can be common. At the same time, the physician proceeded with doing the molecular analysis and found that the patient was negative for driver mutations and was Veristrat poor, and this informed the patient and physician on second-line treatment decision. Based on the Veristrat poor results, they had a conversation around continuing chemo, and they discussed best supportive care options as well as immunotherapy. Based on the expected response discussion, the patient chose immunotherapy, but they aggressively monitored the patient for response. This last case study is a 67-year-old female, stage 3B adenocarcinoma, with a poor performance status of 2 to 3. This makes them ineligible for a lot of clinical studies. Because there was no molecular information available up front, they started the patient immediately on standard of care platinum doublet regimen. And that patient progressed rapidly, and they moved immediately to an immunotherapy second line. Again, no response and poor tolerance. After obtaining molecular testing and proteomic testing at third line setting, the results demonstrated that the patient had advanced in their disease state as well as had a Veristrat poor result. The third line treatment option based on these results and a discussion between the patient and the physician is that another round of therapy, they elected to not have another round of, of, of therapy because the patient thought it was better for her overall quality of life as well as the overall financial burden, not only for her, but her family. So these are examples of how a prognostic test can be used in, to inform treatment decisions and treatment strategy and benefit both the physician and the patient and the patient's family. So the key takeaways from this presentation, Veristrat is a non-invasive, clinically validated blood-based proteomic test. It is highly prognostic and allows and it's, the results return to the physician within, within 72 hours. This allows physicians to improve their overall management of the patient, which results in improvement in outcomes and quality of care, as well as it allows physicians to meet their OCM metrics. The Veristrat is covered by Medicare and most commercial health plans. So we appreciate your time and viewing this um, educational video. If you have any questions about 
the content of educational video, you may contact me directly at the email provided on this slide, or you can go to the website for additional contact information. Thank you for your time.